Hello there, my name is Martin Henley. This is the Effective Marketing Content Extravaganza. And if this is your first time here, you couldn't possibly know that I am on a mission to give you everything you need to be successful in your business, providing of course what you need to be successful in your business is to know more about and be implementing more effectively, more efficiently, and more enthusiastically sales and marketing in your business, which is of course what you need. You need more customers more profitably, and eventually everything you need to do that will be here on this channel and let's not pretend there's lots here already for you to get involved in, interested in. Um, so what happens here is I'm here giving you everything I know about sales and marketing. That's the what the series that happens on a Monday. On a Tuesday, I bring in anyone I can find with experience to share with you if you are looking to be more successful in your business. That's Talk Marketing on a Tuesday. Every other Wednesday, Melanie Farmer comes through and we speculate wildly about what's going on in marketing news and what it might mean for you in your business. And on the other Wednesday, I review so you don't have to. On a Thursday, I'm here thinking out loud. And on a Friday, we react to the very best and the very worst of marketing content on the internet. So if that sounds like it might be interesting or useful, please tell me it does. Then now would be the very best time to like, share, subscribe and comment and get involved because that will give us the motivation to continue on this epic, epic journey. Now, if you are catching this on the day it goes live, it will be a Tuesday, which means it's talk marketing, which means we have a guest for you. Now, today's guest has sales experience going all the way back to 1996 when he was sales ad executive. He has sales management experience going back to 2020. He has been training salespeople since 2007 and has been sales training manager at IMO Art and head of sales training at BT Directories. He has been running his business, Sixth Door Limited, since 2011. He provides innovative ideas to drive businesses to deliver greater customer experience, enhance reputation, and increase profits and sales. He was introduced to us by the marvelous Susie Matteson, who was raving about his sales psycho course, uh, where he goes deep on the psychology of selling. Today's guest is also the co-host co of the Sales Dojo podcast, Today's guest is Chris Dawson. Good morning, Chris. Morning, Martin. Good to be with you. It's good to have you here, man. I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little bit today. I've been so excited about this all day, and now it's all gone a bit fluffy. Um, what strikes me about you, we've got something in common. We went to the University of Central Lancashire, um, so that's interesting. What I didn't tell you when I just told you that I went there, on the last day, my last day in Preston, I left about 10 o'clock in the morning, and there were two guys beating each other up with chains at Preston um, train station at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it just always, uh, that would always stay with me, that that would be my last memory of Preston. I don't know how you found it. Sounds fairly standard Preston behaviour, Martin, really. Yeah, it wasn't a PNE game on that day, was it? No, I think it was just like a random Tuesday or Thursday morning. It was 10 o'clock in the morning and they were just, they were just there. But where did I go? I lived in the shadow of Preston North End, um, the stadium. What was that called, that area? I mean, this was a long time ago now, man. This was a long, long time ago. But um, yeah, interesting memories of, um, of Preston. Yeah, so you will, have, you will have lived up Deepdale area. Deepdale, um, that's exactly where I lived, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, was, I was really fortunate at UCLan. I lived round Avonham and Avonham Parkway. This means nothing to your listeners, I appreciate. Um, <laughs> so I lived in various different streets next to a leafy park, not too far from all the nightlife. Um, so, oh. yeah, I really enjoyed my time at UCLan. Very nice. Very, very nice. Okay, good. I didn't even know, I didn't even know people who lived around that way. Everyone I knew lived in Deepdale. It was striking to me how dark it was all the time. Like it would, in the winter, it would get dark, light around... 10 o'clock in the morning and in the afternoon it was getting dark already by like three o'clock so it was astounding to me like if we had a lot of fun we could easily get our days and nights backwards and you could wake up at six o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the evening you'd have no idea if it was the morning or the evening that was kind of my abiding memory of um preston maybe yeah standard student behavior is to turn nocturnal at some point isn't it yes yeah, we used to go to the snooker hall and play snooker from like one o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock. I think they had a stupid, super cheap rate. And um, that's what we used to do. But if the days and the nights, like if it's equally dark, it doesn't really matter, does it? Not really. There's no days or nights in Riley's snooker hall, is there? 
We know Is that. Is that what it's called, Riley's? It was, it was back when I was there. I remember the snooker hall. There was, um, did you guys ever, on the last day of term at the student union, they used to do a thing called the longest day. Did you ever have that? So no. they'd open the doors at midday or I think even 11 in the morning, back before 24 hour licensing laws. And they'd have live bands on and DJs and uh, events and everything right the way through to two o'clock the next morning. It's called the longest day. It was like the big end of the year bash. Um, wow. Because I used to sell to, because it was about a tenner to get in and you needed a load of spending money for the day. And I used to find whatever I could at wholesalers, start at the back of the queue and work, walk my way down the side of the queue, randomly fly selling stuff to people in the queue, which raised all my money for my beers all day. So I remember one year I got 250 fake glasses with the plastic nose and the big ears on them like joke okay. shop sort of thing big hold all 250 pairs of these fake glasses with plastic noses put a pair on and then sold a few for like two quid a pair to people at the back of the queue and just made my way down the queue and the more people saw people wearing them the more they wanted them and i shifted a lot of them by the time i got to the front of the queue had a few hundred quid in my pocket, paid me way in, and had an amazing 12 hours partying with an empty bag and the whole place had funny noses and plastic glasses on for the event. Brilliant. That was a great day. Yes. That student, union, that student union was amazing. I mean, I had some amazing nights there. We saw like Joe Brand there. I mean, this is going back to the mid-90s. We saw, yeah, and they had amazing DJs come through and bands and oh, it was epic. Yeah. Yeah, you're reminding well, had, me now. They had two big nights. One was Stand and Deliver, the comedy club, which was Friday nights, and you got really big comedy acts there. Uh, yeah. And the second, the club night was famous in the 90s called Feel, and a Feel yeah. night at Preston Union. Yeah, they were fun. We, they had some really big name DJs on. Wow. Oh, man, you are causing me to reminisce positively about Preston. Like, mainly, I just think about those two guys with chains when I think about Preston. But I, I did have a really good time there. And it was the time, right, so people, we will put timestamps in so people don't have to listen to this. But it was the time, it was Corner Shop. Do you remember Corner Shop? So they were yeah. in Preston. Brimful of Asher. Brimful of Asher, yeah. So they were a Preston band. And the Boo Radleys were a, a Preston band. So they were kind of hanging knocking Boo. about the place. Yeah. yeah. And that amazing album, which might be the best indie album ever, Lazarus. That's such a good album. Such a good album. Okay, cool. Excellent. All right. So we've got lots in common. And then you went on to sell advertising. I've also sold advertising. I think all the best people have sold advertising. So I think that's good. The other thing that I'm interested in before we bring some order to this is your business is called the or Sixth Door Limited, not even yeah. the Sixth Door, but Sixth Door Limited. Am I missing a reference to something important? It is quite random. Um, so let me tell you about I set Sixth Door up in 2011. And you have to find a business name, don't you? And I looked at all sales training companies out there that were Achieve, Aspire, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's just not what we're about at all. The, the goal of Six Door is if people change the language they use externally and internally, they'll change their outcome. Okay. Now, the yep. Sixth Door is from Hindu folklore, where there's a big temple. And this is a true story. There is a big temple in the south uh, west of India, the Karachi region. Um, which is famed for being solid gold temple. And it had a long corridor with doors down it. And the sixth door was a huge ornate door surrounded uh, with carvings of the god Vishnu in snake form, protecting this door. And behind the door, Hindu mythology says, is the greatest treasure ever known to man. But the door would only open if you said the right enchantment. So it's a, a Hindu version of the open sesame myth. And the, the, the folklore is over years, people have tried to break in to get to this treasure unsuccessfully. And everybody who's ever tried to break in has fallen ill. Family members have had accidents. Basically, you've been cursed. If you try and break in, you have to use the right language to get to the greatest treasure of all time. And when they finally opened it, 
And the other rooms in there, by the way, there was treasure. They found jewels and gold and things. They finally went into the sixth door and it was empty. It's a completely empty chamber. And the, the, the religious teaching and the moral story behind it was the greatest treasure known is different for everyone. For some people, it's wealth. Others, it's family. Some people, it's health, travel, whatever it might be. But the key being, if you use the right language, the right words, you'll open the door to the greatest treasure, whatever that is for you. Now, my organization, Six Door, trains sales teams all over the world, sales people all over the world to change the language to get whatever is treasure to them. Sales training is just a vehicle to it. It could be personal development. It could be leadership. It could be whatever. You change your language, you change your outcome. So that's where the sixth door comes from. Um, yes, on the surface, it makes no sense to people, um, but it really does drive everything that we do. Yes, but you know what? People must ask you a lot. Yes, isn't that brilliant? Yes. Isn't it brilliant? Because that's what you need is you need a hook. You know, you need somebody to say, so this is why... It doesn't matter now that there was nothing interesting about you that nobody knows because this is your hook. Do you know what I mean? This is my theory of how we bring peace to the Middle East. Because you know when you watch a game show and then you're looking at these people and none of them look very interesting. But then I ask them, you know, where are you from? What are you into? What's your family? And then all of a sudden you're kind of interested in these people. So my, my theory for bringing peace to the Middle East is to have a game show which brings in people from all of the different parties nationalities and then they see them on the game show and then they start to like each other more that's my theory what do you think i think we should call a meeting with the un and see okay. if we can make this happen everybody's got a story haven't they and it's fascinating yeah. to listen to everybody's story yes the only story i've got is the one about the the, the guys with the chains at preston station <laughs> <laughs> but you've painted a picture about preston for everyone now so well done <laughs> definitely have and you've corroborated you know it probably is i mean i saw some mental things into i also lived in johannesburg but i would say that preston probably compares with johannesburg quite well in terms of the crazy things that i've seen okay cool shall we bring some order to this yeah probably a bit of structure would be good eh? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of structure would be good okay super cool so as you know there are only five questions um, the first question is, how are you qualified to talk to us about your specialist subject? We haven't actually nailed down what your specialist subject is. Um, the second question is, who do you work with? How do you add value to their lives? The third question is, what should people read? No, the third question is, what's your recommendation for people who want to get better at your specialist subject? The fourth question is, what should people read? The fifth question, who can you throw under the bus who might endure or maybe even enjoy to have a conversation like this with me. So, your specialist subject, what would you say your specialist subject is? Because I know what I'm hoping it will be. You tell me what you're hoping it will be, and I'll tell you if you're wrong. I am hoping it will be the psychology of sales. Okay, that is definitely a part of it. Um, okay. I would say, rather than the psychology of sales, more human behavior within a sales environment um, okay. mixed with cold outreach, the dreaded cold call, the dreaded cold outreach. How do you go right. from nothing to having a relationship with somebody? Yes. Good. Okay. I like it, but we need keywords, man. <laughs> okay. So yep. keywords would be cold calling, human yep. behavior, sales and selling. Sales and selling. Okay, cool. Okay. So then the question is, how are you qualified to talk to us about cold calling, human behavior, and sales and selling? Okay, so like any good salespeople, I would class that as an objection. It's a really similar question, isn't it, that anybody's listening to this is going to get. If they make a cold call, and quite early on, it's not an objection, but it's a statement that stops so many people in the tracks is, just tell me what you sell. What do you do? And people immediately go, well, we do this and we do that and we're fantastic and we've won an award and they we on people. They say we about them, where really it's not for them to say. So I would say it's not for me to say why I'm qualified. It's for over the next few minutes for people that are listening to this to judge. I've had a, a very long sales career in some very weird and wonderful ways, which has right. helped me garner and learn decades of experience 
mixed with a natural curiosity to learn more, which has resulted in some fantastic results. So let me give you an example of my qualification, Martin. When I was 17 years old, all my friends used to, student jobs over summer, pick cabbages, cut leeks, work on the farmer's fields on these, what was back in the 90s, £2.30 an hour, back-breaking work. And I worked selling oil paintings door to door. I cold door knocked residential housing estates to sell them oil paintings. And you learn a lot very quickly doing that. And then progressed all the way through. Yes. You look like you want to ask. Yeah, well, no, I just, because now I've realized I saw your post from today, which is about weighing on people. And I just, I, I didn't want to bring it out, but you have now. This is what you mean is when people are talking about themselves to people. Like we do this, we do that. That's what you talk refer to as weighing on people. Yeah, it's and and it's not just when they have sales conversations. You read it on home pages of websites. You see it on so many LinkedIn posts. Is people say you know when you well why should we buy off you? What do you do? People say well you should buy off us because we were established in 1978 and we've won this award and we've got a great customer. We 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 now one of the hardest pills to swallow in sales, if anybody's got a sales role or new to a sales role is nobody cares. Nobody cares about you. Um, because of the spotlight effect, which we can discuss if you want, they care about themselves, their problems, their challenges, their desires. Um, so the second we start talking about us too early, people just switch off. Okay, good. I'm loving this. I'm absolutely loving this. Okay, because I did a lot of cold calling in my life and I always felt like it was a personal victory if I got to the end of the call and they would say, sorry, I, I didn't catch your name. And I would say, well, actually, I didn't throw it. Do you know what I mean? Because exactly like you're saying, like everyone wants to phone them up and say, I am calling from and they don't care at all. Do you know what I mean? Why would they care? You know, if they cared about you and your business, they would have been on the phone to you. Um, okay, good. So I'm loving this. Um, 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 what do I want to know? What I want to know is I've got issues is what you're going to learn about me, Chris. I've got issues. <laughs> we all have. I... We're just cucumbers with anxiety. You're okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Right. What I want to know is the thing is I've had the conversation now with every salesperson, with every sales trainer I speak to, with every salesperson, it just frazzles my mind that sales is such a maligned career. I had an amazing time selling. Even when I was cold calling, like the very first sales job I ever had was brilliant fun. I was cold calling. I was making friends with people. I was rattling cages. It, it was amazing. Um, I don't know if we need to have the conversation again. I don't know if you've got anything new. You don't know what I've said to all the other people. Why is sales such a maligned endeavor? I think it's but maligned on both sides, isn't it? It's maligned by the people that do it, and it's maligned yep. by the people that receive it. Yep. And there's you'll you'll probably see, and this because this this phrase can be used across any part of the sales process. You can't turn LinkedIn on any hour of the day anymore without somebody saying cold calling is dead or doing this doesn't work. Um, and people saying, I hate receiving sales calls. I hate salespeople. And so, well, you know what? I hate films and I hate food and I hate the weather when it's bad. Of course we do. Um, yes. You know, I, what I love, and if you hear a really good, artistically created, amazingly delivered sales call. It's it's like listening to poetry. It's like watching your favorite movie or reading your favorite book. It should be enjoyable to receive. Why it's maligned is one, there's a lot of bad sales practices out there because people don't invest in the salespeople. And this is culturally different around the world. I can only really speak very well uh, informed from the UK, sales still isn't seen as the profession that it is. 
So if you said, I want to be a doctor because I want to earn a starting pay of 60,000 a year, okay? You've got at least seven years of training and education before you go anywhere near prescribing medicine to a patient. You can go and earn that money in sales on day one after half an hour in a classroom, being told your product and off you go. So people think that's all it takes and then they don't achieve it. And they say sales is rubbish, sales is fake, sales is false. To get the level of income and success you get from being a lawyer, a teacher, a doctor, a surgeon, these high paying jobs, you've got to treat it the same. If you want to make serious sales, you've got to take sales seriously. But a lot of people enter sales as I'll do this till a proper job comes along. A lot of businesses look at sales teams as people will just bring them on board. And if they can't do it after three weeks, then they're obviously rubbish and we'll get rid of them. No, in 2023, sales is a highly skilled role to do professionally. And it gets rewarded that way, but it, the whole paradigm of sales needs to change to if you're in sales, it's, it's a long apprenticeship. It takes a long time to hone your craft and you've got to take it seriously. Just like if you were going to be an architect or a lawyer or what have you, you can't just pick a yellow pages up, hit a phone and expect to be good. It's something you should treat with respect, whether you're a, a salesperson, an employer of salespeople, and then no wonder people that receive bad sales outreach or bad sales meetings malign sales it hasn't been trained properly. It's not been given the respect that it should. I would love a world where sales is a degree at university, where sales skills are on a school syllabus. Why should they not be? You've got to sell yourself at a job interview. You've got to sell yourself to a life partner. You've got to sell yourself on why you're good at something, why you should have self-esteem, why people should find you credible in the world, but we don't train it. We don't help people do this. I think it's the paradigm of sales that needs to change, that it's a profession like anything else, and it takes a long time. I'll put my soapbox away for you now, Martin. Okay, you do that. You are saying things very similar to what I say. It frazzles my mind. I talk about my mind being frazzled all the time. My, 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 my mind is essentially frazzled, is what it is. Like Susie and I, we actually Googled it in the conversation. It's about a third of the working population in the UK who are in customer facing roles, who would benefit from some kind of sales training. And the thing that, that really does my head in is like when I was at school and I was the Larry kid and I was disrupting things and making people laugh and blah, 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 blah. No one took me aside and said, look, Martin, all this stuff that you're doing is going to be really useful to you when you have a career in sales. But if you could just put a lid on it for now, do you know what I mean? That, that would help us all out. Because like if a third of the population are going into some sort of customer facing, customer engagement role, whether it's customer service, sales, account management, retail, whatever it is, then surely that should be on the syllabus. Like having... Um, I mean, you'd, you'd need to, like, you, you'd want to call it influence, but I would imagine they don't want a third of the population influencing people. But being able to influence a conversation, no, let's call it this, being able to have a productive conversation with a prospective customer or a customer, like, that should be, that there should be somewhere on the syllabus for that. Do you know what I mean? If yeah. we're putting stuff in test tubes, and putting them on buns and burners. How many of us are going to work in laboratories? Do you know what I mean? It's like, that isn't of any use whatsoever. Well, That's what I think. Let, let, let's break this down as it's a human need, is whether there's influence or persuasion or whatever in there, it's, it's, we, need to, we need to support and train young people with communication skills, person-to-person -person communication skills. So where are the benefits of this? Well, look at it from a, a, a direct sales point of view. There's three voices that you can hear in every sale. There's what your customer says to you, what you say to them, and really importantly, what the little voice in your head says to you. Now that's emotional intelligence, isn't it? Now, if we who, could take who is, your- Who's the little voice talking to, the buyer or the seller? 
talking to the seller you've got as a seller you've got a little voice in your head now the buyer's got a little voice in their head as well but you can't hear that so you can't you don't know what that's saying but if, the more you can control the little voice in your head that's saying you can't do this they're not going to buy it um they don't really mean that they're not the right whatever it might be the more you can control that the better an outcome you get in sales now if you're a young person and you're sat somewhere thinking i've got no self-esteem i don't like how i look i'm never going to do anything great with my life nobody likes me any of these things and let's face it in the world now we are in a, a mental health crisis with young people if we could help how they communicate with themselves and each other and understand what's going on it's not just business that this is going to help it's people in general but there's two big things you don't get taught in education one how to learn surely that should be the first thing that you learn when you go into education and two how to learn about yourself how to communicate with your teacher and with the person sat next to you so you can make a friend so you can sit with a group of people at a lunch table so you can have a rational conversation with somebody that you disagree with these are intrinsically important skills um which we're just expected to know well they're not genetically passed down they've learned through social groups and external extrinsic influence um so some people are very lucky they're in an environment where they get all this stuff but so many people aren't and i think all the way through if we then got to graduation level and people had an inbuilt base level of these skills it would help in all industries not just joining a sales team 100 percent agree with you 100 percent agree with you 100 percent agree with you that's three times that's so i'm absolutely agreeing with you but <laughs> I think it's, I don't, I think it's personality. I think it's, um, like you say, they'll put you on the phone for three weeks and see if you can work it out. Do you know what I mean? Or if you can do it or yeah. not. And the reason they're doing that is because sometimes, not often, certainly not the majority of times, but sometimes it, the magic happens and they get somebody with the personality and kind of the interest and and all of those things and it kind of works um i mean rarely rarely what what do i think about that i think yeah i, I mean you're right like communication skills should be there like like people aren't talking to each other anymore at all do you know what i mean but being equipped to be able to carry yourself in a meeting in a conversation in a workplace in an interview that would be a stupidly good idea. What's and from what you said, Martin, you, and you're right, though, like any skill, you will find some people are really, really good at it. Others are mediocre at it and some people struggle. But we would help everybody raise wherever they're naturally going to be a bit further. Um, not everybody, um, you know, loads of lads in the UK play football when they're growing up. Some of them are really good. Very, very few make it to the premiership. But we help them all. And at least it gives everybody a level of fitness and a level of enjoyment and everything else. Um, so many people in business play golf, myself included. We're never, ever, doesn't matter how much training we get given, I'm never going to be Rory McIlroy. There is that extra thing. Like, as you said, some people just have that personality, don't they? Brilliant. Well, hone that on top of some learnable skills you've got a powerhouse but it would genuinely help everybody lift the bar a bit yeah and i'm 100 percent with you i mean the thing is what we're talking about is the most necessary component of being in business like if if you're not selling you're not in business you know so th that is also in the mix here and what's also in the mix is that see i think this will challenge your psychology uh, or your psychological thinking. I think, and I really think this, I think that people don't believe there is value in the things that they are selling. That's what I think. It goes on a lot. Like not everyone, but a lot. I do like to make up a statistic here. So I'm going to offer 
86% of businesses don't believe that what they're, they're delivering offers value. The business or just the salesperson within that business? I think the business and then by extension, the salesperson. So I can qualify it for you a little bit. Um, the, the thing is, like if you're in business, you should be a solution provider, you know, but the, the, the solution you're offering is to a problem that you've already solved. Do you know what I mean? It's like I could teach you to ride a bike, but I don't really see the value of riding a bike because it came so easy to me. Do you know what I mean, I don't understand why it's so difficult. Or let's say I could um, sell you courses in having a perfect backhand in tennis, but it's difficult for me. Or, or let's say I'm Roy Keane, I could manage a football team and I don't understand why they can't kick the ball the way I could or tackle the way I could or run the way I could or, or do all of those things. So th part of the issue of being in business is that the problem you're solving is one that you've solved a long time ago. And so, so there is that issue. Do you know what I mean? The people that you're giving the thing to are diametrically opposed. So oh, I'm talking too much, but there is something about, there is something about businesses who think, and I've experienced this, that they just need to try and convince as many people as possible to con as many people as possible into buying their stuff because they don't really see the value in it. That's what I think. And that's where a lot of the bad reputation of sales comes from, doesn't it? You know, if, if yeah. you're trying to influence somebody to make the decision you want them to make, then you're, you're, you're going to go down that wrong path. To me, sales is simply helping somebody make a decision. Don't get attached to what that decision is. Just yeah. help them make a decision. Now, uh, and... And I, I do get it sometimes, and I'll put my, my, my hand up to this as a, as a sales trainer and a coach as well, is I can hear somebody on a sales call and just think, oh, how do you not get it? Well, because I've done it for nearly 30 years and they've been at it a week. That's why. And the same principle goes for selling is if you are in any sort of sales situation and you are going, well, they need what I've got. I know they have need what I've got. How do you know? It's just narcissism. Your job first is to find out about their world. Forget you, forget your products, your services. Find out about their world. Um, only then can you look if they qualify for a further conversation, if they qualify for your help. Okay, so this is what I also think is that I just think the mission is wrong. And it starts like when I my first job was a telesales job. I was doing telesales about half a percent of the time, 99 and a half percent of the time I was doing telemarketing. You know, I was sorting through the database, trying to find who's in business still, who's not, who are the, making the decisions, you know, what are they buying, where are they buying, when are they buying, can I get hold of them? And then I was still doing marketing because I was doing the work of understanding, is this person actually going to benefit from what I'm selling? So it would have been really useful if they told me, instead of saying, this is a telesales role, and if you don't hit your target, you're failing. If they said, this is a telemarketing role, and your target is you know, to achieve the marketing, it would have been a whole load more successful. But then I think that goes throughout the process. It's like everything is kind of misnamed, misjudged, mis something else where it's not useful if what you're saying is that the job of a salesperson is to qualify is this person going to benefit from this product and are they in a position to secure it i'm 100 percent with you that's that's like the job you know and if they're not that's fine move on to the next one and if they are and they like you then there's a good chance they'll buy you don't have to convince anyone of anything yeah there's <laughs> And it's very different through the sales process. So if, let's take the top of the funnel. The area I work at most is that cold outreach. Keep that consistent prospecting going. There's a few things that have to happen there is one, um, they don't have to like you. This is a myth peddled by sales trainers who are obsessed with rapport. You've got to build rapport. Rapport comes from the French word rapport, which means connection. Now, right. true rapport is, I'm sure, Martin, you've got somebody in your life that you could be in a crowded room with. You could see them the other side of the room. They could give you a nod. You could give them a nod and you would know exactly what each other were thinking. 
you've got that connection with one person in your life, could be your best friend, a family member, somebody like that, and you both think, yeah, this is shit, let's go. Yes. Now that's. I mean, I think there's probably a, twenty people who know I don't particularly enjoy parties at my time of life. So yeah. I don't know if I'm nodding it's shit. But um, that connection with somebody else's rapport. Now you try and do that at top of the funnel, you just sound completely disingenuous. You just come across as a biff. You don't need to be liked. Rapport takes time, so rapport will look after itself. You need respect. That's where people go wrong. They so desperately try and be liked, two things happen. They come across as disingenuous. So you get put in the sales bin and two, they attach their ego to the outcome of that conversation. I must be liked. And if 97% of your marketplace is not in a position to do business with you at that time, your ego is going to get battered. And that's where one of the biggest struggles in sales people find is that rejection, that that mindset towards it because they've attached their ego because they equate a no or a non-successful conversation with them. It's nothing to do with them. You've got to totally take your ego out of that. Stop trying to be liked. I mean, don't try and be disliked, obviously, but don't worry about rapport. Worry about respect. Worry about them listening and engaging with you. Rapport will come. Okay. I agree with you. So I'm going to qualify my previous statement and say, as long as they don't dislike you, there's a good chance they will buy it from you. Yeah, it's so true. And and secondly to that, the qualification side is remove any idea of an outcome. So let's imagine there's an SDR sat right now. He's been in his job or her job a few weeks and they've got a sales manager floor walking, loving that power. You're going to get me a meeting today. How many meetings are you going to get me today? Give me a number. We've seen sales offices like this, haven't they? So they pick up the phone going, I have to get a meeting. Well, no, because everything you now do in that conversation is geared towards that one outcome, that one goal. You're going to try and force it. You're going to bang a square peg in a round hole. When you hear an objection, let's take a common objection. Um, Martin, our budget's been spent. We've got no more budget this year. Because you've got one goal, I've got to get a meeting out of them. That seems a huge barrier to you. So you start to panic over the objection. If you remove any idea of an outcome, I'm just here to learn about them and qualify. Is it worth us talking further? When they say our budget's frozen for the year, our budget's gone. It's not a huge barrier because you're not trying to get an outcome. Relax. Hey, that's cool. Most people I speak to haven't put aside a budget for this in the first place. What sort of stuff do you usually invest in when it comes to training? Nice and calm. We can have a conversation because conversations lead to sales. So I would say ego in the bin, take that outcome orientation out of it. You've got to qualify them. Okay, good. The issue is that I don't think, I mean, I don't know. This is the first time I've ever thought about it. I don't think it's the salespeople putting their ego on the line. I almost think it's like sales management or even sales thinking that, because this frazzles my mind. <laughs> it's like if someone says no and you take that personally, here's the best example I've got. It's like a blind date. So you get, you, you're on a blind date and they don't turn up and people see that as like a personal affront well that person didn't even know you that person never even met you so it's got absolutely nothing to do with you i mean it's a hundred percent to do with them they're the sort of people who don't turn up for blind dates do you know what i mean and it's like but they will take that as a personal rejection and salespeople do it on on the same on the phone they're like they'll phone up and they'll be hello my name is and my company is and blah 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 and the guy will go or the person will go not today thank you very much and they'll be like, that's a personal rejection. You said eight words to the person. Do you know what I mean? It's got nothing to do with you. But I think if I were to write a sales book, that might be the title. It's got nothing to do with you. Because like it really that. hasn't. You know, all you are is the enabler in a situation. You know, you're, you're making them aware there's an opportunity. And for me, you should be qualifying them. 
really, if you can get them thinking about, is this going to be valuable or not? And get to like a meaningful, that I've thought about it and it's not going to work. That's almost the best you could do as a salesperson. Because if they've thought about it seriously and come to a meaningful, no, it's not going to work, then I think that's as useful as making the sale. But businesses don't see that. That's the issue. No, and there is one caveat I'd put on it from this is, yes, you've got to put your ego in the bin. It's not personal. It's not about you. It's just how it is. Um, however, if what you should do, you can only control what you can control. And salespeople quite often focus on things that are totally out of their lane and worry about that, which is pointless exercise. If we just focus on our own lane, if it's going to be, it's up to me. When we do get a, we're not interested, we don't take sales calls, we're happy with what we've got, whatever it might be, the one thing you can do is rationally think, okay, what's in my lane that could do different here? Just assume it's your fault. Just assume it's what you've said that has created that outcome and just treat it as a learning exercise. What could I do differently next time to maybe get a different outcome than we're not interested, goodbye? Was it something I've said? Review it. Be really open to the fact you might have got it wrong. It's not a personal slant. Shouldn't have any effect on your ego. But if you've done 20 calls and 10 of them have said we're not interested, maybe look at what you're doing to get a different result. Because you can't control the prospect. You've no control over what they say, do, think, feel, hear, whatever. You've only got control over what you do. So start there. Could I open the call differently? Could I have handled that objection differently? Am I calling the right people? Um, am I doing the outreach in the right medium? Always review, but not personally. Yes. Hmm, what do I think? I think, what do I think? I think like you, you have to, we have to relook at the whole sales, but, and businesses have to do this seriously as well. Like the whole sales paradigm. Like I've got a couple of presentations that I've done. One of them is called I'm in the mood for selling where everybody's up dancing to the Nolan sisters at the end of the presentation. It's marvelous. Like when it works. And the other one is called the most powerful clothes in the world ever which is basically the world no, the word no, I'm not going to sell this to you. <laughs> Just cancel them, qualify them out. Um, the thing about that is, what is the thing about that is, I really think it's got nothing to do with you. Do you know what I mean? Like the very best you can do is get them to think about it seriously. You know, they may not need to think about it very long seriously, um, but that's the best you, if you're in a cold outreach situation, I really think there's a danger in selling things to people who don't want to buy them. I really do think that's a complete waste of time. And I, b I really believe that that is essentially the premise of sales is that you've got to sell this to people who, who, who don't want it, you know, because, because it comes back to this idea that nobody sees value in the thing that they're selling. Um, I think I'm talking too much. I've got an issue with objections. Okay. What's your issue? My issue is, like you, I know, for example, when someone says it's too expensive, there might be 20 things that they mean when they say it's too expensive. So when a salesperson rushes in and says, but, 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 I don't think that's how you answer objections. I think my major issue with objections is quite often people will object because they really do object to the idea that they might have to buy this thing that they don't need or want, you know. And I don't think when we talk about handling objections anyone ever takes that into consideration do you know what i mean is that actually this may not do them any good yeah it's i mean sales 101 is it a real objection some are smoke screens some are your fault some are genuine reasons why you've not qualified them properly and they can't buy it um they're the wrong person they're the wrong sector um it's the wrong time of year you're the wrong solution there's Friend of ours, Jerry Hill at Connect and Sell always says, there's four types of no. There's no, not you, no, not this, no, not now, and no, not ever. You've just got to work out which type of no that it is. Um, Good. Our brain quite often goes to no, not ever. That's very rarely the case. If we're, if we're qualified right and we're, we're on the right people and sector, yeah. our ego says it's no, not you as in they don't like you, it's a personal thing. 
it's usually either no, not now or no, not this. And the goal of any objection when you receive one as a salesperson is very simply to get to the truth. That's it. It's the word handle them that I think is really dangerous because one, nobody wants to feel handled. I mean, you just immediately turn into a sales biff when you do that. I mean, only a few weeks ago, somebody wheeled out a feel felt found on me. Oh, I understand how you feel, Chris. A number of people we speak to felt the same. Put your head in the bin. You're handling me. I don't want to be handled. I think you've got to flip them. Just explore them. Get to the truth. What's going on? So they say, well, it's just too expensive. Oh, okay. We don't often hear that. It sounds like you're comparing that to something. What What is that in relation to? Right, we're now into a conversation. We've asked a question. We're now exploring that objection. Conversations lead to sales. Or more to the point, conversations lead to the truth. Yes, 100%. I'm with you. Good. And I also teach that, um, that actually... Okay, but I've got an issue. I did warn you. <laughs> lots of issues. <laughs> lots of it. I'm a bag of issues, man. I'm a bag of issues. We, uh, you're 100% right. Nobody wants to be handled. Nobody wants to be dealt with. Nobody wants to be dismissed. Do you know what I mean? And so if somebody's got a meaningful... I, okay, so here's the, the issue that I've got. It's this idea that they might put up a smoke screen because it just suggests that there's some subterfuge. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why would why would a prospect... Why would a or, or a contact whoever you're talking to? Why would they put up a smoke screen? Why would they do that? Most commonly because they don't feel they're allowed to say no, but they can't say yes. Right. We haven't given people a safe space to say no. Now, right. Quite often when I talk to businesses and they come to me for support for the team and that, one of the big things they'll say is we struggle closing. Yes. I said, okay, let's look at what you're doing at the beginning. If you're not closing it at the end, it's something you've done early on. It's not the end that's going wrong. Because what's probably happening is you've not started it right. So when you get to the end, you're having to rely on tactics. And then people feel that and you're gone. So let's take any closing objection that you get. If it's a smokescreen one, it means I don't feel safe to say no. I don't feel I've got permission to say no. Well, how do we counteract that? Well, early on, give them that permission. So for example, there's a hundred different ways to do this. Um, Martin, typically what happens at the end of these meetings is one of two things, either through our conversation, we'll both agree this isn't a good fit for you, in which case we'll part company as friends and I might ask you for a referral or we realize this is a good fit. This would be a good solution for you, in which case at this stage in the process, we'd ask you for a purchase order number. Martin, would you be comfortable making either of those decisions for us today? You say, you know, I want a yes or I want to no, but are you going to give me that? Give them that permission, really friendly, to give you that no at the end. So instead of them saying, well, you know, we've a number of stakeholders, we've got this, they can go, you know what, Martin, from what we've said, we really like you, but this just isn't a fit for these reasons. Now that gives you the opportunity to explore it, but you can get the no instead of getting the, we need to think about it, budgets are tight, blah, blah, blah. Give them permission right at the beginning. 100%. Okay, so Susie and I spoke about this and she said one of the nice uh, things about selling to Germans like she very often does is that they will tell you no. Whereas yes. I think British people don't want to be so impolite. Yeah, and I think that is a real issue. And for me, the issue is pipeline. Like salespeople believe that as long as the prospect hasn't said no, there might be a chance that it could happen. Now, I know that's a joke. I know that 95% of anyone in anyone's pipeline, especially in the UK, has absolutely no interest in what you're talking to them about. Um, but they believe as long as they haven't said no, there's a chance they might say yes. I mean, this is, it's like a desperate dating game, do you know what I mean? Um, where as long as they haven't said no, then there might be a yes in your future. Whereas I think the job of a salesperson should just be to get to that yes or no as quickly as possible. Qualify them in, qualify them out. That is the job for me of salespeople. You know, it's got really nothing to do with 
people say the same thing to me, like they struggle to close. What I always find out is that they're not able to open. Do you know what I mean? They're not able to get the prospect to a point where they're talking openly. This is how we do it. This is what we use. This is when we use it. This is why we use it. This is the worst thing about it. This is the best thing about it. If I could get to the very best situation, it might look something like this. And then this is how we buy things. This is when we buy things. This is how much we, do you know what I mean? That's an opening conversation when you've got a prospect speaking to you like that. But I think salespeople go from my name is and I'm calling from and we do this and this and this and this and um, blah, blah, blah. And are you interested? And then when they say, no, we're not interested, they're surprised. No, nobody's interested until you get them interested. So the job of a salesperson, the trick if there's a trick of salespeople, is to get people talking about their situation, you know, themselves talking about it. There's, there's how I look at it. There was a, a really nice quote on the radio. I think it was by Professor Brian Cox that he was talking about religion versus science. And he was saying that re any religion, let's be open to this, will take any tiny little fact it can and immediately say that confirms this is true. Yeah, but well, no, yeah. it's a miracle. That's it. This tiny thing happened. That's it. There is God. There is whatever. Science will do everything it possibly can for years to prove something's wrong. Only when they cannot prove it's wrong will they say it's a fact. Totally opposite. Now, so many salespeople hold on to hope, hopium addiction, as it's called. That oh, well, they said this. You know, you ask so many salespeople right now, if you're a salesperson and you're listening to this, does this conversation with your manager sound familiar? What's in your pipeline? How are they doing in your pipeline? Oh, I've put them at 80%. We got on really well. That is zero indication of whether they're going to do business. But they take that one little thing and they take that as evidence that they're going to do business. Whereas what salespeople should do is do everything they can to qualify them out. And if that person will not qualify out, then they're a really, really strong likelihood of a deal. Yes. And then also, I mean, there was one sales job I had that worked completely on reverse psychology. We had to basically phone people up and tell them they couldn't buy this thing was the only way they would ever buy it. And it, it was a beautiful thing. You know, it was a beautiful thing. So that, that this comes maybe not quite full circle, but it comes around to what we were saying before about this idea of rapport and that you have to be nice to people to get them to like you. That's not actually true. I mean, I am a relationship seller. Like I've been good mates with all of my best customers my entire life. So I, I do believe in rapport and I do, and I can establish rapport in, in a call or otherwise it's not, it's not bulletproof. Do you know what I mean? Is they either going to like me or they're not, but you know, I can put together a nice representation of myself to get them to like me. Um, what's the point about that? It comes back to what you were saying before about the one objective. If the one objective is try and get them to like you, how desperate do you stink now that you're on the telephone trying to be likable? And then the point I'm making now is that actually being likable isn't about being nice necessarily. It's about being useful. It's about being... Um, showing some leadership it's about do you know what i mean it's about something other than just being nice like no one's going to like you because you make them a cup of tea for 15 years they're going to like you because you did something meaningful for them in their lives maybe i don't know and this is where i think so this is the point where i was going is where sales to me looks a lot like leadership it's like what you really want to be doing is finding those people who are having this issue in their lives and leading them to make a positive change to overcome that issue that should be the role of a salesperson, which is an entirely honourable thing to be doing, no? It's really interesting if you look at a, a good sales model, not a sales process, but a model for how to sell, and you yeah. look at a coaching model, how to coach people, and you look at a therapy model, how therapists deal with people, they're exactly the same model. Yes, the only difference being the therapist goes a lot deeper than the salesperson does. Now, if you've been in sales long enough, you will have felt like a therapist for some people. But our job is to be non-judgmental. It's to learn all about that person's world, to help them maybe think differently, to ask them questions they may not have been asked before to help them think. 
to help them become possibility conscious. What would be different if this happens? Is it worth that being different? What's the cost of inaction? Just a coaching and therapy model. It's a sales model. What a therapist wouldn't do is if you had to go to therapy and you sat on their couch and they said, tell me, what's the problem? They said, oh, well, this terrible trauma in my life or whatever it is, the therapist wouldn't go, well, I'm an excellent therapist and I've got an award for therapy and I could definitely help you with that with my therapy. But they'd yeah. go, well, tell me about that. What happened? They just go into your world. They don't try and cure you straight away. They're exactly the same model. But what they also do is they try and lead you to the solution or not even lead you to the, to, to the solution, but to help you towards your solution. I did a, had a brilliant chat with a guy called Simon Bowen, um, an Australian guy. He's got a business called The Models Method, I think might be the name of his business. But w we were saying similar things. And he was saying that sales should become the most noble thing that we do because it's where the money comes from, you know. And But also he was talking about the psychology. And he said the psychology is essentially that everybody is scared, but everybody wants to win, you know. So you can see in that situation where you know, people are scared to maybe make the choices that they need to make or the decisions that they need to make. So you can see how they might need to be supported to make those decisions. And so an effective salesperson for me in that situation would be supporting people to make brave decisions about what it is that they need to do or what it is that they need to do if they want their situation to be better, maybe. Good. We're philosophizing a little bit. That's all right. That's See, right. sales might be a lot deeper than some people thought. It might be a lot deeper and it might just be a lot. The thing is, oh man, the thing is, a, a friend of mine's a sales trainer and he's got this little shtick about the word sales coming from the Norse word sellia, which means to serve. And I've tried to corroborate this for about 15 years and I can't. <laughs> but the idea is, mint do you know what i mean the idea is 100 percent. like if businesses were to employ people rather than be salespeople, uh, employ people to support their customers to make the right decisions buying decisions that would be first prize wouldn't it yeah it's you're there to support them making a buying decision but you, you're there to help them make a decision yeah. um uh, and this is where it falls over a lot is sales interactions end with no decision they, they end with well okay great have a think and we'll speak again in a couple of weeks nothing yeah. that's you've not achieved anything there there's yeah. no next steps yeah you've got to have next steps in there that's what the decision means the decision could be we've decided that we'll talk again on tuesday at 11 o'clock about this this and this and if that's in place, then we'll look at the next step. You're yes. in control, next steps, there's decisions being made. Doesn't mean they're gonna go, yes, here's my checkbook. It means there's a series of decisions to, to not to an end goal, because buying off you isn't the end goal, because then there's after service, there's re-signing with you in 12 months, there's a 10 year relationship. The actual bit of first buying off you is just a part of the process. So yeah, the decisions, the helping people make that decision is help them make lots of small decisions along a very long path. Yeah, and this is what I think a close is, is a close is just agreeing to go on. And this is where it comes to, I'm a Roy Keane fan, I'm sorry, I don't know even which football team you support or if you care. But the thing about Roy Keane is he put himself in the game every single time. And the issue, I think a large issue in sales and buying is that the buyers are... No, let's just say the salespeople are too scared to give the buyer an opportunity to say no. And the buyers are too polite to push the issue and say no. And so this dance goes on forever where nothing is actually happening. Like the yeah. salespeople aren't making their target. The buyers aren't getting the important things they need to get done in their lives done. And so it just becomes this ridiculous dance where nothing, yeah, exactly like you say, nothing really happens. Okay, would you like some good news? Always. Excellent. I think you are eminently qualified to talk to us about sales. About well, sales in the way we qualified it, cold calling. Um, so the question then is, who do you work with? How do you add value to their lives? 
Okay, so businesses most commonly approach me globally now after 12 years when they have sales teams that either aren't producing enough new leads, so they're not doing enough outreach, they're not doing enough prospecting, or they're doing enough activity, but it's not yielding the results, or their team is in a bit of a pickle and it needs reviewing. Uh, I quite often get referred to as grandma, as in we've asked them to do that 10 times and they've not done it, Chris. You asked them once and they've suddenly sorted it out. And that's how it's like grandma tells you to do something, you do it, don't you? I'm a fresh set of eyes. So business is appropriate. Grandma. grandma, yeah. It's my northern oh. accent in the way they yeah, uh, me it's grand. Saying, it's like so, grandma. Okay. So how that works is let's take an organization contacts us and says, our team's terrible, they're not doing this, right, right, right. Well, that's that's one person's reality of it, out of everything. What well, yeah. our first job to do is to find out the actual reality. So we'll speak to the leaders, we'll meet the sales team, we'll listen to recorded calls, we'll watch recorded Zoom meetings, we'll review sales processes, everything. What's actually going on? And then discuss metrics, where are they, where do they need to be? And only once we've discovered the truth of what's happening, we'll then design completely bespoke training to help them get there. Really laser focused on their people, their team, what's going on. Because until you know, it's like going to the doctor and saying, oh, hi, doc. And he goes, hello, take two of these. Bye. What? <laughs> no, you've got to find out what's going on. So we then create this completely tailored training solution for companies, be that BT, uh, American summer camps, the chambers of commerce, whoever it might be. Right, because this also extends then, I think, into training, because I, I'm also a trainer, where you very often are just expected to know <laughs> what, what the content should be or what the course should be. or And the suggestion is, if you don't, then you're not very good. Do you know, do you know what I mean? It's like weird like yeah. that. Um, okay, it's a pitch. It's a pitch, like when you train people. like So the reason they've told them 10 times to do something and they're not doing it, it's because they haven't motivated them to do it. Do you know what I mean? That's that's what's going on. So this is where maybe it gets a little bit meta, but it goes back to what we were saying at the, at the beginning. Like these skills to be able to influence, motivate people, which is what I think we've agreed selling is, so useful. You know, because if you're in a management role and you can't pitch your team to get the thing you need them to get to do to get done, then you're not an effective manager. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Or if you're teaching a group of school kids something and you don't motivate them to study to get through the exam or all of these things. For me, it's just motivation and influence, influence and motivation, you know? Yeah, motivation's interesting, isn't it, in sales? Because motivation is very personal for everybody. And for a lot of sales activity, I believe that, that we, we focus too much in sales management positions and leadership positions on motivating our team because they then wait to be motivated. I think if I was an SDR now or an AE or whatever acronym we have for salespeople this week, sat there, I believe, and it's what always got me my results, was self-discipline. Nothing to do with motivation. I need discipline. Because some days you are not going to want to make that call. You are not going to want to go to that meeting. You're not going to want to handle that objection. For some salespeople, you're not going to want to get in the car and go to work that morning. And sales is about whether you like it or not, it's about doing it. And here's what the amazing thing that happens with discipline is, once you start doing it, that leads to motivation. Action leads to motivation. So if you can just pick up that phone and make five calls, you suddenly feel a lot better. It's like going to the gym. It's the hardest part of going to the gym. Put your crisps down, get off the sofa, put your trainers on and get out the front door. That doesn't need motivation. That needs discipline. Once you're at the gym and you're doing it, you start to feel good. You start to feel motivated and you'll get the memory of that, which helps you discipline the next day getting off the couch. But for me, the motivation all starts with self-discipline. Great salespeople make that call, do that meeting, qualify out, work on that objection, whether they want to or not. It's not about being motivated. It's about doing it. And then you feel motivated. 
And we want a feel motivated. It's endorphin release, isn't it? But the best salespeople are really disciplined. Okay, good. Um, what do I think about that? The reason they need motivation is because I think 90% of sales jobs are shit jobs. <laughs> That's what I think. There's no, <laughs> pro, there's no, there's no marketing that gone on proper old fashioned, like, have we got the right product? Are we targeting the right people? Have we got the price right? You know, all of that stuff. Are we actually generating leads? Because now you say, I mean, because let's call a spade a spade. Are we allowed to say that? We are allowed to say that. Um, Because we're talking about spades, are we? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So the thing is, if, if salespeople are doing outreach, that's marketing. And actually that's probably definitely the least efficient form of marketing you can do you don't give them any budget you don't give them any data you don't give them any tools email marketing systems websites pay-per-click campaigns all of this marketing stuff what you're doing is giving them a telephone or worse giving them a pair of shoes and telling them to go and knock on doors that is the least efficient form of marketing there is it's not unworkable but it's not sales it's marketing I disagree in as much as picking the phone up is my mar- to me and I know this is an age old argument uh, to me marketing the line between marketing and sales is a conversation so if I'm a salesperson doing an email campaign that's marketing so there's no conversation there it's a one way communication or if I'm sending right. out text messages or whatever if I pick up a phone and engage a decision maker in a conversation that's where sales begins i can have marketing behind me to get the chance of getting to that conversation higher and i think sales and marketing should be absolutely hand in hand nowadays but to me picking up the phone if you've got the right list got to get your list right and you're trained right is well it's statistically proven the most effective way to to jump the queue on the sales process and have a conversation with people that you want to do work with but I wouldn't call it marketing, I call it sales. Making a hundred phone calls to a random page out the yellow pages, hoping that somebody picks up and is relevant in any way. Well, that's not even marketing, is it? That's just spray and pray and is resigned to the 1980s, isn't it? But a good, well-researched list with a well-crafted message and a well-trained salesperson to get attention is the most powerful sales tool that you can have as long as you mix it with everything else you've still got to use social media emails everything that you possibly can don't pigeonhole yourself well i think the lines are more blurred than they've ever been i think salespeople are are equipped in as much as they can have twitter accounts linkedin accounts they can make a website for themselves it cost them you know 20 minutes to to do to actually get it done so i think they're more equipped to market more effectively than ever but my line is a little bit further down the track. My line is, like for me, marketing generates leads. That's the, the final job of marketing. Yeah. And they throw that ball then to the salespeople. And a lead for me is where they have demonstrated a meaningful interest in the, the thing that you're offering. That's a lead. So if they're doing outreach and they are cold calling and they have 10 meaningful conversations a day, for me, that's not, mar- they, they generate 10 leads a day that that that's marketing you know anyway we don't need to argue about that um we're going to run over by a couple of minutes is that cool have you got somebody that you're rushing yeah yeah i've got a have got a hard stop in about eight minutes okay cool eight minutes so let's go quickly question number three can you in a minute give me your recommendation for anyone who is looking to get better at cold outreach anyone who wants to get better at cold outreach one take it seriously study there's a million podcasts, million books, million YouTube channels, million TED Talks, million anything. You can't just do nine to five, turn up and hope it's okay. Hope is not a strategy. There is more content out there than ever. I shouldn't have a job if people were disciplined enough to do personal development. 20 minutes a day invested in yourself will make a huge input. And secondly, really value the concept of compound prospecting is something future you thanks you for that's why it can feel like a thankless task 
but I don't know anybody who wouldn't benefit from doing more prospecting. But the key to it is consistently. You cannot do a bit of prospecting. You must do it consistently. And suddenly in six months, you'll look back when you land a huge account from something you did six months ago and go, thank you six months ago, me. I'm glad I was consistent to do that. Just keep going. Excellent. That was about six seconds. That for me is really interesting where you're saying hope is not a strategy because I think the vast majority of salespeople are, are, are out there and they don't have a strategy for taking the person they're talking to from where they are now, which is just becoming aware of maybe the, the opportunity to do something different in their lives to where you want them to be, which is where they're actually doing that something different. Do you know what I mean? So th I think that's brilliant, brilliant advice. Good. Question number four. Um, what should people read or what content should people consume? Uh, well, as you can see, standard Zoom meeting bookshelf behind me. Um, I would say anything from Daniel Pink. I'm sure you're aware of Daniel Pink's work. Um, one of my favorite prospecting books out there is Problem Prospecting by the guys at Refract. So Richard Smith, Mark Ackers, etc. Big yellow Excellent. book, Problem Prospecting. Uh, and Andy Bounds, The Jelly Effect. Love that book. Yes, I also love that book. Good. Excellent. And uh, the sales dojo, would you recommend that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know whether it was good etiquette to plug our own podcast on your podcast. We're not ashamed to be selling here, bro. We are definitely not. Selling is the most uh, noble thing that we do here. Okay, good. Excellent. So now I just need to check in with you and see how you are feeling about your experience of having appeared now on the Talk Marketing Show. Lovely. Uh, you know what? It's really nice to just sit and have a blooming good chat about something that you're passionate about with somebody who's equally passionate about it. Um, yes. You feel like you're talking with somebody, not at somebody, which is a great sales conversation in itself, isn't it? Hundred percent, hundred percent, good. Um, but there is motive in the question, which is if you've enjoyed yourself, then I'm imagining you wouldn't find it too difficult to throw a couple of people under the bus who you can introduce me to, who you think might also enjoy or maybe just endure to have a conversation like this with me. Yeah, if Susie hasn't mentioned them already, our fellow host of the Sales Dojo podcast, Leon McCowan. Uh, Leon has built and sold uh, telecoms businesses for decades, uh, is a powerhouse in the sales industry, uh, and, a, and a great friend of mine. You'd have a great conversation with Leon. Um, and secondly, you know who I think you'd have a lot of fun with? Jilly, uh, Jilly Thompson. If you've been asked to speak to Jilly Thompson, she was Jorex's salesperson of the year two years in a row. She has sold a lot of condoms and sex products, and she's got a lot of stories about sales and selling. You'd have a good laugh with Jilly. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, so if you could drop me a like LinkedIn introduction, I think the way Susie did for us, then that would be fantastic yeah. and I will pick it up from there. Um, man, I, th I just feel like we did too much philosophizing maybe, but I think that's what's necessary. I think that's what we need to be doing is thinking about what it is that we're doing and selling. I think that sounds like your message. Yeah, we, if you want to make serious sales, you've got to take sales seriously. And if we can do anything that just makes one person think a bit more, oh, actually, you know what? I need to look more into that. I need to take that more seriously. I need to learn more about that. You never know where that leads. Um, some of the greatest sales successes I've had have been a shock because it was one key incident, one thing that I did, which created the butterfly effect. And before you know it, you've landed one of your biggest ever accounts or you're dealing with fantastic people. You never know where it's going to lead. Uh, that one sales call, that one meeting at a networking event. So, yeah, we philosophize a lot, but we're talking about language and Language creates our reality. There's no way you can't yeah. philosophize about it. 100%. I feel there might be another conversation in us. Maybe I'll touch you again in three or four months and maybe you'll want to come and have another conversation. I really want to get towards like the actual language and the psychology and those things. If we could do that in the future, that would be really Absolutely. cool. Do you want the really good news? Go ahead. We got to the end. Very good. You are, you are free now to get on with your life. So all we need to do now is say goodbye for the benefit of anyone who... Um, is still with us. Um, man, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I feel like we could have another conversation and get to some conclusions. That would be good. 
Um, but I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time today, man. This has been really cool and interesting for me, at least. Oh, it's been great to have a chat. Thanks for having me on, Martin. You are very welcome. Thank you for taking the time to check out this episode of the Talk Marketing Show. If you found this interesting and useful, then YouTube thinks you're going to enjoy this one. And this is the latest thing that we've posted. If you haven't yet and you could take a second to like, share, subscribe and comment, then that will give us the motivation to continue on this epic, epic journey.